and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a WeBank certified life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase the importance of science advocacy, health equity, and influential leadership through conversations with senior life science leaders who share their unique perspectives on the leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guests today are the co-founders of San Diego Squared, more commonly known as SD Squared, a nonprofit focused in increasing diversity in STEM-driven companies through partnerships, programs, and financial support for high school students, college students, and their educators. Dr. Bill Rastetta is the chairman and Mr. H. Puentes is the executive director of SD2, an organization that is stacked with a pivotal mission of empowering tomorrow's STEM leaders today. On a personal note, Bill is also the chairman of the board of Barry Bioscience, where I serve as a board director and member of the corporate governance and nominating committee. I also admire Bill's passion for photography that was inspired by a Kodak box camera that his mother gifted him at the age of 11. That's the story that he shared at our very first conversation and I will never forget it. Moreover, it's truly an honor and pleasure to welcome you both to the show, Bill and H. Sophia, wonderful to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, maybe starting with you, H, uh, my first question for all guests is always the same, which is, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Yeah, I think when I think of scientific innovation, I think of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, scientific innovation is born out of a diverse perspective, a novel idea that has been operationalized and, and brought into practice, right? Uh, the energy that these innovations are born from are unlike anything before. Mm -hmm. They're different. Uh, they impact all industries and aspects of our lives. Uh, a solution to a problem that's felt by many, a new form of communication or an improvement to the human condition. And they essentially become a new standard for the next generation of innovators to build from. So when I think of scientific innovation, I think of diversity. Great. I love that. Diversity of thought is really integral to advancing scientific innovation. So thanks for sharing that. Now, switching to you, Bill, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Well, of course, when we speak of innovation, we speak of things that are new, that are previously unanticipated, that are novel and perhaps even surprising. Mm -hmm. And I think as you look at science and mathematics, often innovations come from young people who haven't sunk into the dogma and into the conventional wisdoms, right? Um, for me, uh, uh, moving from chemistry into fields more allied with medicine, uh, I have been very, very lucky to be involved in scientific innovation uh, for healthcare, for healthcare breakthroughs to develop new standards of care, uh, both for therapy and for uh, diagnostic purposes. Uh, I was remarkably lucky to be involved in the discovery, the invention, the development of the first monoclonal antibody that um, was ever approved by the Food and Drug Administration for cancer therapy. And of course, monoclonals are a mainstay of cancer therapy today, and more recently involved with the uh, development of gene sequencing uh, for early cancer diagnosis. Um, and uh, I am hopeful that uh, both of these things are going to change the life expectancy very, very significantly for patients afflicted with cancer. Well, uh, thank you for taking us on the story of, of your journey as an innovator yourself. I think it takes a lot to innovate. One of the things that you mentioned in your definition is the role that young people play. And that's probably a key reason why you are so passionate about SD Squared because you believe in young people. So switching gears to our next question, SD Squared connects underrepresented students to the power of STEM by providing access to education, mentorship, and the resources that they need to lead the talent workforce, not just today, but also in the future. So for you, Bill, what really is the inspiration for SD Squared and how would you measure success in 2031? Sure. 
Well, I've been involved for, gosh, 30, 40 years in what we call today biotechnology. Uh, and uh, every decade, sitting around the table, thinking about growth plans and hiring and whatnot, we've recognized a lack of diversity in our STEM professional uh, pipelines. Um, there's, uh, there's a quote from James Baldwin, which I think is very, very pertinent here. Uh, he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Uh, some amazing wisdom in that. Uh, so beyond uh, our recognition of this problem of lack of diversity in our STEM uh, pipelines, uh, we actually must face the issue. We must take action. And we at San Diego Squared are facing this issue uh, through a combination of human and financial capital. We are facing it as a generational problem. That is, you can't solve it overnight. Uh, we are reaching back uh, initially to eighth grade through college and graduate school education. Uh, we're trying to make kids STEM curious, STEM committed, STEM educated, STEM employed. And that sequence of curious, confident, uh, 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 curious, committed, educated, and employed takes, uh, takes maybe uh, almost a decade for somebody who begins uh, in, in eighth grade, right? Uh, success in 2031, uh, great question. I think it's when uh, our STEM employees actually reflect the communities in which we've built our companies. Hmm. Hmm. Wow, I, I mean, I'm not often speechless, but I am right now. And I think again, um, for, for someone like yourself to take such a, a close look at what's going on and to actually do something about it, it means a lot. I was born in a developing country in Nigeria, and I know that it's the likes of people like you that were able to facilitate my education and continued career advancement. So thank you for, for what you, you do, Bill. Very much appreciate it. Well, uh, thank me in 2031 if we're successful, right? <laughs> I think we will be. <laughs> I know you will be. I've already seen the quality, quality reports. And for a very new company, I think you all are doing a lot already. So um, I've enjoyed the story and I continue to do so. Um, so switching to you now, Age, uh, San Diego is considered by many to be a top 10 biotech cluster. Can you provide a top final overview of ongoing work at, at SD Squared and how we can help to ensure greater representation of women and minorities in senior leadership positions and boards? Yeah, so as you, as you uh said earlier, SD2's focus on increasing uh, diversity in our STEM-driven companies, right? We want to see these companies reflect the communities in which they operate in. And unfortunately, right now, they don't, but but we can do the work to make that happen. Uh, we've got four uh, focus areas um, uh, for, for 2022. Uh, the first is around activation and events. Uh, the second is a Squared Fellows Program for high school students. Um, the third is a Squared Interns program for our college students. Uh, and finally, we have our Squared Scholars, which is our funding arm that allows us to provide scholarships for college tuition, grants to other nonprofits that are doing great work like life science boot camps and coding camps. And then we give direct awards to uh, students and educators as well. I think at a high level to understand kind of where SD2 fits in the sort of diversity and inclusion space, it's probably helpful to describe the problems that we're trying to solve with our approach. So the first is what we call uh, the company's dilemma. And the second is the community's dilemma. Um, the company's dilemma on, on one hand exists because companies don't have the, the mechanisms within their business practices to build over time a trained, predictable, diverse pipeline of new talent. Companies are presented with candidates who are available today, right now, without the means to reach back into high school, college, uh, to begin preparing students for STEM jobs. On the community side, the dilemma is really similar. Students, educators, and parents have no real mechanism to reach into biotech, medtech, high-tech sectors to find training and employment opportunities. These companies sit perhaps only miles away from uh, underrepresented communities, but the companies can be virtually unreachable uh, for dialogue, for educational counseling and employment. 
the result of this sort of twin dilemmas is that companies struggle to engage in underrepresented communities in efficient and effective ways. And educators and community organizations are forced to rely on a few sort of ad hoc relationships for all their STEM support. Ultimately, if we can solve the twin di dilemmas through our work, then we will be able to begin the process of building diversity within our STEM driven companies. And I think the final piece that I'd add is at SD2, we work to thread the human element into everything that we do, right? Scholarships, grants, awards, that's not new, right? That's been going on for decades, generations, but why can't we um, move the needle? For us, it's because the critical part is not the financial support alone, but rather the financial support paired with authentic human connection through mentorship. Um, students need to see uh, and be mentored by STEM professionals that look like them, that shared lived experience, um, that have you know lived in 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 similar paths. Uh, mentorship builds trust. It helps to improve the student's sense of belonging, their STEM identity, and frankly, the social capital they need to they need to be able to navigate uh, a successful career in STEM. So, this is why every scholarship that we award, every high school student in our Squared Fellows program, and every intern we place through our Squared Interns program will receive an industry mentor that students can empathize with, shares that lived experience, and that is enthusiastically committed to support them for a year. So long-term mentorship as well. Wow, um, I don't know if you know this H, I used to live in San Diego and I knew about Connect. And if I remember correctly, you used to work at Connect. you were on the leadership team and you've raised over $6 million today to increase diversity in the tech and the life science industry. And so I like the continuity in your mission. It's not just transient, but it's been continuous. So, so good, good, good. I mean, just kudos to you and to Bill, of course, on the work that you're doing. Thank you. I've been, I've been lucky to be a part of some great teams that are doing some great work at Connect on the entrepreneurial piece to see more diversity amongst founders, executives and boards of directors. And now being able to work with Bill, you know, reaching back earlier uh, mm -hmm. to, to inspire and hopefully illuminate a path into STEM for, uh, you know, some really great talent that, that should be in these companies. Well, that's extremely well said and very remarkable. Now, my next question is for the both of you, and just for kicks and giggles, we'll go with Bill first. Um, are there any emerging technologies that you're excited about for its ability to improve health literacy and access? I've got a good one for you. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been lucky to participate, as I mentioned earlier, in the emergence of the genomics revolution. And imagine the first draft of a full human genome cost in excess of $100 million to develop. One individual, $100 million. Wow. Today, a full genome, which is about uh, 3 billion base pairs, uh, 3 billion b base pairs of, of DNA, uh, can be sequenced for about $600, down from $100 million. Remarkable, wow. right? Remarkable. And... Um, even $100 per genome may be possible in the not too distant future. Now, at $100 a genome, imagine the power of this tool to better manage our own health. We will be able to personalize medicine, be able to understand uh, our disease susceptibility, we'll be able to engage proactively in prevention rather than treatment, and at $100 per genome, imagine every newborn getting a full genome and that information, all 3 billion base pairs being put into their, their electronic medical record. That then could be referred to using, obviously it's a lot of data, using artificial intelligence to guide that child's healthcare over the next, what, 100 years, if you will. So understanding and utilizing our, ge our genomes will improve our health literacy and our health access. And it's coming. Uh, and I think it's going to be remarkable. 
I, I completely agree with you. I have a six month old son and I can, I can only wish that the technologies were available today, but we're rapidly innovating and part of innovation is to make it accessible to as many people as possible. So obviously the cost barriers are something that we'll continue to work on because innovation should be accessible to all. So thank you for sharing that. And now switching to you, H, any emerging technologies that you're excited about for its ability to improve health literacy and access? Yeah, I think for me, I'm really uh, following closely and really interested in what blockchain technology can do for health literacy and access. Uh, I think the ability to make collaborations more transparent, to accelerate and incentivize those research collaborations you know, uh, the gamification of fitness on the blockchain and and even the the simple ability to track, share medical records across healthcare providers more easily and effectively, I think will have a, just a, a profound effect on diverse communities uh, to come. So really excited to what blockchain technology can do for um, health literacy and access. Another great answer. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think you both have been very economical in how you have framed your answers, and I'm very grateful for that. And as we move on to our final question for today, do you have any other comments or thoughts mm -hmm. that you'd like to share with our audience? Maybe I'll start with you again, Bill. Okay. Well, as uh, James Baldwin suggested, the change, uh, the lack of diversity in our STEM employment pipeline we must face the issue. At San Diego Squared, we are facing this issue as a generational problem, seeking a generational solution. And we will not have succeeded until the middle school and high school kids we're working with now return to their communities as successful STEM employed professionals and become advocates, mentors, and role models for the next generation. I really, really look forward to accomplishing this. We will succeed through partnerships, both human and financial. The pairing of those two, absolutely critical. Extremely well said. A little clap over here. Um, I, I completely agree with you and it's truly inspirational. Now moving on to you, H. Yeah, I, I think my sort of final parting words would be, you know, diversity is in a competitive advantage, right? There's a real business case to increase diversity in your company, right? And when you look at San Diego specifically, you, you, you need only look at the, the venture capital funds that are flushing through San Diego. Uh, the demand for real estate is just, you know, and, and that tells me that companies are coming, they're growing. And we're going to need a talent workforce to be able to fill those roles, right? To, if we're going to continue to grow this industry, uh, we're going to need to make sure that we have the talent to fill that. And I think uh, SD2 is really positioned to help companies think how can they identify talent that can be, uh, you know, join their ranks now, but also how are they investing efficiently and effectively in the communities that are just down the street that have students ready to go and, uh, and great talent uh, that can be found in all those communities that can feed into their company. So I think it's a competitive advantage and we want to be there to help companies companies really uh, build that talent pipeline into their uh, company from communities that are just down the street. Absolutely. And speaking of competitive advantage, I imagine that the business model for XD squared is one that could actually be applied to other regions in the U.S. and potentially worldwide. I imagine that that's in the plan for the future. We would love to do that. Okay. And um, I think what we're doing here in San Diego can serve as a template for others who have other uh, financial and human capital to apply to the same problem in their regions. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here is to improve uh, at every turn of the crank, if you will, uh, every class of students that we work with uh, to solicit feedback and to improve to meet uh, students' needs in a very optimal way. Uh, in closing, I would like to say that uh, our story is laid out in great detail on our website, uh, which uh, we're actually very proud of. It's sd2.org. Two is the numeral two, sd2.org. So uh, please, please join us. Uh, we'd love to have uh, 
your partnership with uh, our organization. Well, I, I couldn't have found a better way to end that conversation today. So thank you both for the generosity of your time and the wisdom that you shared today. I, I truly believe in, in, in San Diego Squared mission. And obviously it's one that ties into my personal mission to inspire, encourage, motivate as many people as possible, especially women and, and minorities to join STEM because it's truly phenomenal to meet people like Bill and of course people like A, to meet people that are truly innovators in the space. So thank you both for your time. Obviously, I look forward to staying in touch. Sophia, thank you so much. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Same thank here. you so much. Thank you.